Welcome. This is the September 6th Open ZFS Production Users Call. We have Alexandra Moten, we have Matt Aaron, Steve N, Jan B, and myself, Michael. I suspect others will trickle in. And if anything, the Open ZFS Developer Summit is coming up October 16th through 17th. I have my flight ticket, but not anything else yet. Matt Aarons, would you like to give us a status on, say, the call for participation? And if you're looking for sponsors or otherwise? Yeah, um, yesterday was the deadline for submitting talks. So if you are still thinking about sending a talk, then uh, please get right on that. Um, and uh, we'll be announcing the speakers in a couple of weeks. OK. Uh, and yeah, uh, we have a few sponsors. There's more sponsorship opportunities. Um, so uh, if you'd like to either share your uh, work with ZFS, uh, please submit a talk or uh, email me right away. Or uh, And if you would like to you know, be known as a, a company that's uh, sponsoring and supporting OpenZFS and keeping it alive, then uh, please consider sponsoring. Thank you. And are there any categories of talks you're after, be it nuts and bolts, be it administrative, be it something perhaps we haven't even covered over the years? Um, you know, it's it's pretty open. Uh, I'd say the talks that have been most well received have been either talking about a new feature that's being worked on or um, talking about like how an existing subsystem works. Um, but we, I think there've also been talks that folks have enjoyed about like how you're using OpenZFS in some unique way or, um, you know, something you discovered about its behavior, like uh, it performs well or not well in this situation. Um, and we'll also have a hackathon. So, uh, you know, that's a good opportunity for folks who are new to the community um, and for folks who are not necessarily, uh, you know, C programmers um, or programmers at all. Uh, th there's always opportunities at the hackathon to work on um, other other aspects of the community. So documentation, the website, conference organizing, uh, stuff like that is definitely appreciated. Fantastic. Okay, good to hear. And I will absolutely second the notion of documentation. And if I don't get to it in advance, I think I have a few opinions on the native encryption manual page, which I think is a bit ambiguous on terms like key, when it should be like decryption key, en encryption key and others. So that it's all fair game. And uh, for those who have not attended, these are fantastic events. Yes, Jan. It's all symmetric encryption. So the decryption key is the encryption key. Got it. Uh, which is sometimes passphrase, which is sometimes a few things. Oh, so it yeah. maybe benefit from some clarification. Yes, the different uh, kinds of keys, but it's not that you have a encryption and a decryption key, which are separate. That is good to know. And maybe that alone needs to be spelled out for those who assume it might work like something they've used before. Anyhow, um, that said, Mav, you had a point on the auto mounting behavior if you correct a, if, as I understood it, yeah. correct a mount point. Do you want to describe uh, the yeah, scenario? No, I, just, uh, I'll start slightly wider. Uh, last week or two, my colleague, Umer Salim was working on PR, which is now now on a 15 to 40, just was just opened last night, I think. And uh, like it started originally from the fact that if you try to set mount point sharing SMB or sharing FS, depending on whether sharing or mounting succeed, you will get errors for property setting, which was not uh, correct. Like for, because uh, mount point was set, property was set, but you still receive an error. So we started investigating that to primary Umer uh, and found that uh, first we, we have property set and not only then trying to mount, we may receive some mount error. We report that error, but property is already set. So we try to slightly polish that area and to uh, not report errors which are not property setting errors. But on, on that way, we found an uh, interesting question. Where the change of mount point property uh, should always try to mount 
the file system. Because right now, if file system is not mounted for any reason, then setting mount point doesn't mount it either. So uh, from it from first approach, it kind of sign, sounds reasonable. But problem appear, for example, if first time we try to set mount point or something wrong, got error, it wasn't mounted, we try to set it to something correct, and then it's not even mounted, even so it's correct and it should. So that patch uh, mentioned 15 to 40 uh, tries to always mount file system no matter what was before, unless it was explicitly disabled with can mount property being disabled. But question why a previous behavior is such and is there any legal use cases where we need it or just going more straight approach, more predictable would be good. So we have primarily just a question for thoughts here on a ticket or on a ticket anyway. I but personally maybe... would love to separate housekeeping operations, like perhaps you're doing a bunch of renaming, your a bunch of uh, operations, and then handle the mounting separately. But I'm sure there's scenarios for each. Um, I'll try to find that ticket. Most of the commands, and I think all of the commands uh, which deal with mount points have a flag to not perform the mount unmounts, except for the explicit mount unmount commands. So you oh, can uh, do something, uh, uh, rename, I think it's dash n, uh, normally to not perform the mounts and leave the mount points as is for now. Of course, if they're inherited, the next time the system will come up with different mount points. But this way you can do the renamings without affecting the file system tree layout. I know there is a flag for import and flag for receive. I wonder if there is a flag for set, or the FS set. Um, I don't think that there is. I mean, it may make sense to add that. I think otherwise, in, in the absence of a like dash n, don't try to mount flag. I think trying to mount unless can mount equals no auto probably makes sense. But the problem with this is that you're setting up a trip wire you can stumble over later if you do something like that because then the system is working now, but it, it's similar to ZFS receive without mounting. Yes, the system di did not overmount the um, paths now, but the next time you boot, uh, if the mount property is set the wrong way, suddenly you you for example on your backup server received uh, backup of other servers will be mounted all over the place if you persisted as is, just not mounting it the first time you received it. On the next reboot, you will get a terrible mess if you do it like that. Yeah, you are mentioned. probably need to set can mount equals no auto in that case to indicate the intent of not trying to mount things at boot. Yes. Can mount to no auto and using some other manual mounting logic. No, so with, uh, can, with can mount, it kind of it should already work and it makes sense. I was wondering more about situation, for example, when you uh, imported or received it with that minus n flag or whatever it is to not mount, or you just manually did unmount something or ZFS unmount, whatever command directly, and then you're trying to set mount point. Current code won't mount it, but uh, with the patch mentioned, it will be mounted just you know, for consistency sake. So that, but, uh, is there any reason why somebody would manually unmount file system and then try to change mount point? Mm. Part of manually reorganizing uh, a pool, maybe. Yes. 
Yeah. I mean, I think that the original intent was to leave the mountedness in the same state it was before, unless you like explicitly say, you know, ZFS mount. Um, but I think that you could make a good argument either, you know, that you should try to kind of get it into the state that you've specified with the mount point and can mount properties. Um, and you know, that would be reasonably expected. So no objection to that approach to, to always mounting. Both no, like like yeah, I understand that both ways have their logic, the arguments. But no preferences one over another. Yeah, I'm okay with either way. Interesting. Speaking about no out, uh, just unrelated to this topic, uh, of no, I guess on, on can mount, but uh, why is it not inherited? Uh, like, what's the idea? Can mount or? Uh... Well, at least man page tells it's not an inheritable. Yeah. The idea is. Uh... If you want the pool data set layout, all have to follow the file system layout and you have directories which aren't mount points and you want the mount path and the data set name to basically embed into each other or map one-to-one, -one, then you need a dummy unmounted um, data set in between just a placeholder so that you can have children under it. Yeah, I think that makes sense. For example, if you use boot environments, you have your boot pool, then you have, uh, for example, root in uppercase or something, uh, data set under there, so it's not the root data set. And underneath that, you have the potential root data sets, and you never want to mount the, this intermediate data set you only want to mount one of the child data sets. Wait, and at the end, it appears not even the full data set. It's some uh, just placeholder, practically, that you will it never write. It is to... a data set. Yeah. Oh, like you can manually it mount it with mount dash T ZFS data set to some mount point. Yeah. It's but just it's not used, used that just way. Just as a kind of properties placeholder. Oh, that's also a good idea to inherit properties of it for which can also be useful if you want to uh, maybe group Z vaults per virtual machine using them or something. Oh, yeah, but would it be inheritable as a property? I was thinking about different use case. For example, I have pool which I don't want anything to be mounted from automatically. I could set just... Uh, the no, idea here is that... Can, can can mount. I, I could set just can mount to no or whatever disabled on the root mm -hmm. and had everything disabled um you can set the mount point to no auto or something or legacy i think and then that gets inherited and nothing gets auto mounted so oh, there's yeah, a special but, uh, value but, for the mount point but then I, I i can i can't uh, have uh mount point property after that like all the description of can mount uh says that mm -hmm. its benefit is to not uh, to, to allow not to mess with mount point property. Exactly. But its functionality is limited since it's not inherited. No, I would it's have intentionally to it not inherited because you do want the child data sets to be mounted if you use it as placeholder. Well, but or, what if not placeholder? If I What if I don't want some subtree temporary mounted because it's some backup or, or something? Then set them set the mount point to what is it legacy i think but i want them to keep the mount point if i want to restore the backup later preserve it in a user property hmm. <laughs> yeah i know it's not perfect it's... yeah it's just weird not so many properties we have that are not inherited and this one of weird ones yeah but there is a common use case for it, which where it makes sense. You have a different one, but it doesn't make sense. I don't know if the functionality you want exists. I think it doesn't. No, I, I, I'm not going to change it. I'm just curious about it, just from reading. 
my question mostly ended at that ticket 15 to 40 uh, about mount point change and auto mounting. The second one was just out of curiosity. But okay, thanks. Hmm. I suppose, Matt, is there any history on why that property is not inherited? Do we clarify that? Yeah, I think we were thinking of the use case that, that Jan mentioned, um, you know, where it's used as a, as like a, a place for setting properties, but where you don't want to have any contents in that data set. Got it. That's a great description. For example, you need a VAR data set, but you don't want to mount it because you want the VAR directory to be part of your root file system. Mm -hmm. But you want so, things like, let's say, VARDB to be its own. So you need an intermediate file system so yeah. that the inherited mount point makes sense. Same with user, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Exactly, user, but you want maybe you want your user local to be its own data set, but not USR, you know. Mm -hmm. Alexander, does that help or do you have a lingering question? No, oh, I, I understand that logic. I yeah. now I'm thinking uh, maybe because there could be second property with different semantics or so magic values with different semantics, or so somehow like. In some cases, we could benefit from inheriting, and some others don't. But yeah, whatever it is now. Um, do you the data sets you those uh, mount point you want to uh, preserve have an explicitly assigned mount point, or are they just inheriting? Like I, I would like to be able to disable mount, you know, some subtree. If I am receiving, for example, a replication from other system, I don't want it to be mounted locally. All right. Yes. For that, you have to rewrite the right properties on either send or receive, whoever you trust. No, yeah, that's what uh, I'm doing now for my own backups on on receiving site. I, I deny and receive of uh, mount point properties, so they get dropped. But uh, that required me to know what was those data sets in the, the original life, how to restore them. Yes, you can basically warp them and then, yeah. Just normal send receive, don't know where to save original attributes. I would have to do it on source system where it would be bit weird science source system may not even know about that it's been replicated if it's pull replication not push good point okay well we've certainly uh, vocalized some of that uh anything else related to that or shall we take a break and talk to steve about his snapshotting So, Steve, it sounds like you want to do some and are doing some pretty aggressive snapshotting. And as I understand it, not replication. And if I'm muted, go ahead. Describe what you're doing. Uh, so I'm, I'm uh, working with some legacy applications that, although I can touch them, it's nicer to interact at the file system level. So, um one of the things that I do is a um, <clears throat> an, a replication of data where I have a, a base snapshot and then I'm watching the file system for changes. As soon as I see a change on the file system, I take a second snapshot. And then I have um, some things that read the files, the files that changed and produce uh, synchronization to a, a database. Uh, and so then after the that partial sync is done, 
I destroy the the base snapshot and repeat rinse and repeat. Uh, but yeah. do be more specific on. Uh, well, are you watching for changes with the written property or some other semantic? And then synchronizing the database. Are you working off like a ZFS directory or a diff or something else? Uh, so the way that I'm watching for changes is inside of a uh, Rust program that scans the header for certain property increments. So there's a certain byte in these files that okay. will um, increment any time we've modified a record. Are you familiar That's... with the written property? I'm sorry? Are you familiar with the uh, ZFS written property? I am not. It is uh, one of the greatest things I ever heard of, which is uh, the amount of data written since the last snapshot. So if it's zero, then, and correct me if I'm wrong, Matt, of course, and if it's zero, nothing has been written. If it's growing out of control, you have data you may want to snapshot. And so you can do like ZFS get written, uh, get. So give that a try on one of your systems and it may partly answer what you want to do. Um, so, um... I had I hadn't heard about that. I think there are so I'm looking at a part of the file set uh, or, or the data set. Mm -hmm. um, so Is there are there changes you want to ignore. Oh yeah, absolutely. So oh, I'm okay. looking at maybe I'm looking at maybe a tenth of the total file set. Or Can that be set. broken out to a different data set? Uh, it could. It could. We're sort of walking before we run though, so Understood. I'm a little cautious on that. Um, let's see, you had a second part to your question. Oh, uh, you then said sync with the database. Are you doing that at a higher level? Like files, yeah. basically POSIX yeah. level or ZFS level? Because ZFS does some miraculous things behind the scenes. And as I mentioned earlier, there's the like zpool import.n, which does no mounting and is fantastic for replication in a clean state where you cannot dirty your data, I think it's glorious. So, so my, my use case is keeping data in sync as near real time as possible. Um, the only thing I'm using inside of ZFS is the snapshot um, to, to, to assist with that process. Um, everything you else replicate is those with of... a send? No. Oh, OK. Is no, so something precluding that? Well, the the yeah. Let me let me explain better. Sure. I haven't done a great job. So I'm working with legacy software, yep. um, and it's in a proprietary format. Um, and my goal is to create similar data in a highly performant database well, well mysql if that if that matches the criteria <laughs> um, but we're using mysql uh, so it's really to create visibility of the data in a more of an industry standard um, database so once we have you know so we've said we detected some changes we have two snapshots we can look at the files that changed on each snapshot and then kind of dissect them and create the uh, SQL updates. Steve? Yes. How many files do you want to monitor for changes? Um, it's about 400, I think. Are you running uh, some form of Solaris, FreeBSD, or Linux? Yeah, we're running, um, I believe, some variant of Ubuntu or Debian. And this is a local ZFS mount part, or not an NFS, right? That is correct. It's all local. <clears throat> In that case, you could get uh, the notifications via iNotify or on FreeBSD using KQ. 
uh, NFS does not provide these notifications and other network file systems normally don't either. Uh, this avoids having to poll for them because the kernel will notify you when these files change. Mm -hmm. Or when directories containing their name files, one file in a directory changes on some operating systems, but this would avoid the polling. Uh, but it, the annoying thing is there is no portable cross-platform system call for this. But if you only target Linux, it's easy. If you only target FreeBSD and for 400 files, it's also easy. Um, the next problem is, uh, do you have any other files you don't want to uh, snapshot and inspect, which um, get modified? Sounds like quite a few. Yes, um, I would say most of the modification happens within uh, so I'm trying Thanks to remember be careful. like the the data set is sort of like an entire application and then the files I'm interested in are only the one of the subdirectories that are data related mm -hmm. uh, so they, they're like the backing data for this proprietary database unless you uh take advantage of the fact that you can atomically snapshot multiple directories on the same ZFS data set already, I would look into splitting that up into its own mount point. So that because ZFS deletion may be asynchronous, but it's still not that cheap to go through the potential references, make sure that data is truly unreferenced before you can release it. Oh, uh, okay. And I'll throw in one tip there, which is never underestimate the power of snapshotting an empty directory and rolling back to it to an empty state if you want to, you know, preserve the things you want, but dispose of changes that don't you don't care about. You could roll back other things yet yes. in, a, in a child data set where you do mm -hmm. want to keep track of. Uh, regarding Matt's chat answer, um, yes, ZFS diff is great, but as if I remember correctly, the path name is only best effort, and there are corner cases where ZFS diff can't as assign a name to a change. Yeah, especially if you've been using hard links. Yeah. Um, I started out trying uh, the diff. Um, it's a little slow in my case now that could be because i'm again i'm i'm looking at an entire big data set that i haven't uh sectioned out uh, i could section this out and maybe diff would be faster than if the big it's like means 400 files is not people sorry checking 400 files doesn't sound like it would be that slow no oh. it sounds like it should be basically in instantaneous if it's in cache Wow. Okay, uh, I'll try it again. I'm not sure. But, uh, it's been, if it's you been have about a years <laughs> since I started this. Fairly uh, big data set with millions of files and then want to do that and there are only 400 changes. Finding those changes can take time. Something else which may be interesting is to uh, do a redacted send Right. Of the I, so basically, I, if I understand correctly, you're using snapshots to get a consistent view of an um, unpleasant application's state to then turn this snapshot into a transaction on a less painful database. Mm-hmm. Sounds about right. And so basically your local snapshots are your um, task queue to be imported? Yes. Yeah. The, the delta on yeah. any two snapshots, yes. Yeah, and all the snapshots together are how far you are behind. 
um, I only ever have two. So it's either it's either oh. detected a change and it and it has a base and a target, uh, or mm -hmm. it or it's done and it deletes the old base. So there's only ever two in play. Oh, so you only have two snapshots and you're going through them at least once every three seconds. So I I have had this running um, for a while. So I I do have some experience that does mirror what Matt is saying in the chat that it should be fine and have low overhead. I it's it's just been something that has me nervous because I felt like maybe I was pushing the edges. No, I can. I, I agree with Matt that uh, growing beyond like thousand or several thousand snapshots would be bad. Uh, I try to optimize snapshot deletion uh, for a case of too many snapshots, and I've done added some prefetches to speed up it significantly. But still, uh, on especially on spinning rust uh, pools, uh, it creates too much head six to delete too many snapshots if if they are not in arc. It's not very but... well prefetchable. Yeah. Uh, so, but in this case, if you are staying with like very few snapshots, just rotating them quickly, then I would just, uh, my only worry is that uh, each time you're creating snapshots, it's a forcible transaction commit. Like uh, yeah. that's, uh, it's some part of your full bandwidth, uh -huh. an additional overhead. Depends. So you shouldn't go like uh, literally every three seconds, you may already be pushing it slightly, no, maybe not dramatically, but... Um, Steve? Yes. I do you have SSDs or at least your intent lock on SSDs? Um, so I don't know. Um, oh. the, the, the application is deployed uh, in AWS and we're using... So I'd have to talk to my DevOps people. I'm, I know it's not, I know it's not spinning rust. So, yeah, but, but beyond that, I just, I don't, I'm not close enough to the, um, to the actual AWS instance. Okay. I don't think transaction commit should uh, force things into a slog. A slog shouldn't matter. It's not a sync, uh, but yeah, it will create some over here uh, with probably writing more to the disks. And the other thing, uh, it sounds like you have only two snapshots per data set. How many data sets are there? Because just going through a lot of snapshots over time is no problem. Mm -hmm. If having There's... tens of thousands of them per data set, which gets painful. Um, currently, now, the the deployment structure could change, but currently there's less than five data sets per pool. Okay, so I, that, okay, yeah, I'm okay there. That all sounds harmless. Like it's not even a dozen snapshots at a time. That's and most of the cost of having many snapshots, it's snapshots per data set, not snapshots per pool. Um, I did pick up on something you said about less than a thousand, uh, which is good to know because um, I need to advise those guys about how they do their, they, they, they carry uh, quite a few uh, backup snapshots. So yeah. I, so uh, hundreds of snapshots per data set cause no operational problems for me on my file servers. Okay. Um, so don't, uh, but um <laughs> <laughs> crazy for nothing. Uh, it depends. Right. I, I think there. I think there should easily be less than five hundred. Um, but Which I'll is well probably within the tell supported them range that. on reasonable hardware. Can you say that we again? Wouldn't, that's well within the range of what ZFS can do on reasonable hardware. Okay. You may not want to do it on a Raspberry Pi running off a single cheap uh, micro SD card. Your your penalty will be performance, not like breaking ZFS. ZFS will do the right thing, fortunately. So, in its own good time. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, yes, ZFS uh, doesn't have the hard limit to number of snapshots, but problem if you have all of your snapshots populated randomly and uh, evenly, like you're constantly writing, constantly snapshotting something like that and deleting some data, then mm-hmm. problem uh, when you start deleting snapshots for every snap for every deleted snapshots, you need to read uh, dead lists of every other snapshots before or after it. I forgot. Yeah. Uh, but uh, practically, you get n square complexity at some point. So if I like, remember correctly, you basically uh, have to f- read for each snapshot, you have to follow its alloc- unique references in right order, which be- degrades into random reads quickly okay. to confirm that a block is really unreferenced. But Matt would know more about that. So that uh, that information is already collected. That's uh, in, in a dead lists or that that uh, dead list li- live list whatever. Uh, there's just lists of blocks that needs to be freed for every freed snapshots. But problem we have separate list for every. I think previous or following snapshots. I forgot which direction. Mm-hmm. But if you're deleting five snapshots, uh, you you're out of the oh. large amount. You need to like five multiplied by number of remaining. So if yes, you have... of course, if you bulk delete snapshots, then it's uh, M times N. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I was surprised where you got your second power from. But yeah, if you have have multiple snap, let's say you have 10,000 snapshots and you delete a thousand, it's order of about 10,000 times the thousand you delete. So M times N, which... If you delete a significant subset of your snapshots, that becomes n squared. Mm-hmm. Steve, does that help? Oh yes, it definitely answers my original question and about two or three others, so I'm good. Feel free to reach out to those on the uh, invite just with questions, because we've all seen it from different perspectives. Will do. Great. Um, Yes, Steve, yeah. you probably want to look at the I notify rate command. Did you say I notify rate? Wait, I think. Uh, oh, wait. Wait. There you go. Oh, wait. In the chat. Okay. It can okay. rate for files to change, even recursively for a directory to change, do a timeout so it doesn't, uh, because it's a lot faster than not, uh, polling, so it could happen hundreds per, of times per second. So you probably want to have at least a one or two second timeout. And mm-hmm. whenever something changed, it executes a script. Okay. Uh, the command has already been has been ported to FreeBSD, but does not have the same performance characteristics and opens a few more file descriptors on FreeBSD because it has to go through an emulation, but it also basically works for what you are describing. So even if you were to go to a non-Linux platform, you would be covered by just using the same command line tool to get notified about changes. I'm, um, the way that this is working is, um, I have a controller program that's written in Rust. And I currently use um, the command line in order to interact with ZFS. Would I also have to use, would I also have to like exec a, a, a command in order to use an I notify thing? Or is it, is there maybe like a. Yeah, so create for that. Okay. <laughs> Examples. Oh, well, thank you for that. So for Rust, there's uh, a crate which takes care of abstracting the annoyances of a C uh, interface from you. <laughs> Great. Yeah. So with that, your Rust command could have the kernel inform it when the kernel knows that another process has changed one of the files you care about. That sounds like something I will be doing. Right. 
one of the annoying corner cases with iNotify is that if you're too slow, the kernel's buffer for notifications can overrun and then you have lost events. In that case, you have to rescan all. So you have to kind of have a fallback if you do it at this API level in case you get notified that you have missed a notification. I don't know if it, this happened. Uh, if this crate helps you there, but uh, for 400 files, you can just scan them all, which sounds like close to what you're already doing. But in this case, it would only happen in the unusual corner case that you uh, overrun the buffer. Right. Instead of every time. So in case anything not good with iNotify, I'm trying to uh, right now quickly recall what it was. But I have feeling that ZFS, aside of normal uh, access time modification time, has some sort of file generation report to throw F start. But I can't find it right now, but I have feeling as for something. Just some counter that increments each file modification. But the written uh, property on the data No, set? no, uh, per file on, on the VFS layer, per oh, denote. Is that exposed somewhere to user space? I have feeling so. I, I I know we use it. It use the same field field for Samba for uh, list of snapshots for .zfs directory, and we know that it increments each time uh, we have new snapshots created, so that Samba gets can rescan the list of snapshots, something like that. But I have on, feeling uh, it's FreeBSD at least using KQ on a direct file descriptor. You can get uh, notifications via KQ uh, if there are modifications to the directory. You can, I think, you can even filter for appends to the directory, which is what uh, creating a set of a snapshot, if it's properly reported, would look like because you have a new subdirectory in your uh, .zfs snapshot no. directory. Yeah, uh, I'm not argued that approach is. But I think we were doing it in some polling way. I don't know why, uh, why it's Samba is not my daily area. I don't remember. Yeah, it's not the most pleasant code base. But it's kind okay, of... anything else on that? Pretty well fleshed out. And Steve, come back with uh, questions and all. Uh, Mav, do you have a brief summary of the changes you have into? Previous D14, and will it indeed be 2.2? Uh, no, just, uh, just last week I was fighting several uh, reports of problems after FreeBSD, uh, after ZFS was merged to FreeBSD master and stable 14 branches. So I seem like I found a few issues in my latest deal work. Uh, the three patches were merged uh, into upstream ZFS and FreeBSD, and so far nobody else complained yet. So I, I don't know is everybody were on vacation right. during Labor Day or just everything was good, but so far so quiet. So uh, Brian may hopefully create a tag RC4 soon. I already told him that so far so good. So I hope we are. We'll approach finally to 2.2 release, but at the very least, uh, FreeBSD both stable 14 and main now has the same sources as upstream. Okay. So the plan is That's to it. have OpenZFS 2.2 to be released in time to be uh, imported into FreeBSD and uh, MFC into 14 stable before the release? It's already MFC into FreeBSD stable. Uh, it's just if it if, if FreeBSD won't be released in time, no, then maybe dot zero will out with some other name, not exactly a release, but yeah, okay. I I think it's not the first time. I think last time it was the same for stable thirteen branch, no, thirteen zero yeah. branch. We started before release. Unfortunately, it's difficult to coordinate <laughs> with the first releases science. They are not exactly predictable. Better to get things right with a file system than release unfinished code. Yeah, sure. Can't argue with that, but it's, it was a bit stretched already. 
will raid Z expansion make it into 2.2 or not yet already there? Oh, yeah, I think it's still in PR and open. It's not even in master. I would say it's too much for 2.2. I see. Understood. I guess he, like uh, Brian was mentioning that RC4 should be the last RC. So definitely uh, it should not get anything more than minor, Fair smallest enough. bug fixes or the most critical bug fixes. Uh, yeah, Matt, I you unmuted. <laughs> Go ahead. I, I agree. Cool. Okay. Anything else uh, relating to the two milestones, FreeBSD and OpenZFS? Uh, I'll just say keep up the good work. You make our lives easier. Um, I don't, it's a bit late for Anchenig. I can catch you up on what he's been doing, but uh, a bunch of us will be at the FreeBSD Developer Summit and BeehiveCon, and then EuroBSDCon next week. If you have any OpenZFS related testing ideas or bugs to reproduce, I hope to have a pretty hands on hackathon for BeehiveCon for a bunch of networking issues, some jail issues, and then OpenZFS issues. So if you can think of anything, drop me a line, drop them in the doc, whatever works. And just to catch everyone up, Anchenig has been working on a long requested by Jorgen utility for OpenZFS on Windows, which I've been using. And the latest build fixes an, an issue I've been running into where space is not freed up. And in the process, Jorgen kindly pointed out a rather attractive tool for Mac OS that does some basic housekeeping. It lets you mount, unmount, unencrypt, load keys, uh, decrypt, you name it. So uh, because this exists on Mac OS, it's going to be the focus to work on Windows, but uh, Antrin and his colleague are looking at the Lazarus, Lazarus cross-platform toolkit so that one could have this on, say, a an X-Windows-based system. Uh, so I don't know if anyone has like specific features they'd like to see, but actually we started banging out a, a must have feature list in such a tool. Um, if anything, there's a special need on, well, obviously Windows that they're not typically Unix people and they need as much help to get up and running with like a new pool. Whereas on say a, a Unix derivative desktop, you might be fine creating the pool separately, but uh, just want to manage it and get notifications through GUI. So, uh, I'll have to assume Sun, Sun Microsystems had a miraculous tool back in the day that did all of this and more, but I do not know the name of it. <laughs> so your feedback's welcome on such a thing. Uh, and I'll just say note the uh, last meeting. Note the notes from the last call and screenshot. Okay, anything else at this time? Or Steve, I got your questions answered. Mav, you got your behavior on... Mount point One. changes. Yes, Jan. So um, I'm using ZFS trickery for immutable jails in FreeBSD. And I want to have a read-only clone of the user land and then have child data sets which aren't cloned but are contain the jailed state. And when I want to update the parent, which is a read-only file system cloned from some tag of a uh, user land, uh, the problem is that, of course, I can't destroy the uh, old uh, clone without also destroying its children. So right now I have a bit of handwritten shell code which just moves the old one out of the way and then goes there creates a new clone and then renames the children in place to recreate the single uh, child parent relationships into the right tree form again so that all of the mount points align and so on. Mm -hmm. Has anyone written this um, in a more generic form uh, or is familiar with a well-tested script to do this? Or is there a better way to do this? Thanks to uh, Alexander's questions about can mount, I just realized that I could have two uh, 
non-mountable parents with the same mount point property so but so that the children would inherit the right mount points in place so i don't have to assemble them into a single zfs uh, subtree to get a single mount point subtree which may be the way to go but i kind of like seeing it in the single tree in ZFS. But it's finicky to untangle and reassemble. It's not for per se error prone if you do it in a script which just inspects the file systems using ZFS get and then does the right thing. But it is a problem if you have to hand code the special cases because you haven't written the generic version. And I just wanted to know if I should just go ahead and write the generic one or if there's a better way. Interesting. Any other ideas like the multiple identical mount points, only hopefully one of which is mounted or you get over mounts, but other strategies? This would basically be intentional overmounts, which would not overmount the exact order. But yeah, it could become a problem to have them mounted in the right order now if I'd have mm -hmm. two subtrees. And Jan, does that touch on the whiteout that's been coming up on? The jail calls of like, well, how could we have a ZFS native um, whiteout? It turns out that we do other trickery. So far, I haven't needed whiteouts when using the Z the FreeBSD file system hierarchy and the way I'm assembling things, because there aren't any things I had to write out yet, which is mostly out of luck or good file system hierarchy layout that I don't have to write out single files because I either can create, maybe I can overmount whole directories. I don't have to write out single files in a directory. At least I haven't encountered this so far. Hmm. Which isn't saying that it isn't required in some cases and these cases happen it's just that it i haven't encountered one yet but i do think it's only because i lucked out so far okay well keep track um, of what the you problem learned. is that as far as i know zfs has no uh, on disk file type for a write out file unlike the old <clears throat> UFS file system, which did have... Um, oh, it did? Yes, uh, UFS has a write-out file type, which is a special file type, just like normal directory, socket, and so on. Hmm. There is a write-out file type, and that's what enables, in theory, UnionFS, for example, to put a, a write-out file in the overlay, mm -hmm. so that the underlay is hidden, yeah, and have it persist across mounts. Well, and just to clarify, there's no transparency on a ZFS overmount, correct? You simply do not see what was there before. You just have what exactly, that's and that. so far that worked out well. Good point. Okay, but would one ever you... want a ZFS native union mount or transparent overmount? Potentially and zones, and I'm but... sure the zones people have had that nagging question over the years. I think that null FS without full union FS and uh, ZFS with a bit of clever scripting gets you there. Fair enough. Um, Would a cr cross-platform strategy be desired so that the Docker folks could simply say, here's the ZFS um, feature and embrace it? Linux has an equivalent to uh, FreeBSD's NullFS. They call it a bind mount. Mm -hmm. And it's not a special file system. It's just what they call a bind mount. Uh, so you can mount a directory. 
So what you uh, the worst thing you would have to do is to basically recreate the directories to act as mount points and then use bind or nullfs mounts to assemble the directories. Mm -hmm. In FreeBSD 13.2 and newer, you can also mount in uh, single files or other I know uh, file types. The problem with mounting single files is that you, you can't rename them because there's no directory to rename them within on the, the mount point. So the normal thing of writing a temporary file in the parent directory and then renaming it is impossible, which breaks things like editors and scripts, which want to write a temp file in directory and then use uh, mfile move mm -hmm. to uh, atomically uh, replace a file. You can't do that if you have a single file mount point, which is really a normal file and not a directory. Um, it works if you modify the file in place. Okay. Uh, I don't have the number of the problem report you're asking for oh. at hand, which is why I asked. Oh, that's what you're asking. Uh, this is a parent has The one that uh, you don't see the storage released if you delete files in an LFS. Oh, I might, when, when I just a moment ago mentioned not releasing space, that was on Windows with Dora Oh, code, okay. Um, which I can find that PR, but hopefully it's uh, water under because... the bridge. Anyhow. Yeah. We're at one hour. Is there anything else that others want to discuss or shall we call it good? Just a quick short comment. Yeah, I finally, finally found that magic value that is incremented every file modification. It's called Z underscore sec in the node pointer. It is in FreeBSD. It's reported outside of ZFS to VFS layer. I haven't traced where exactly going to user space if it is, but it seems like not in Linux. But yeah, um... I found ZFS does it. <laughs> Okay, Z underscore sec, and yes. it would probably be visible via the sysctl MIP for inspecting files, right? Uh, no, it is reported to uh, to VFS through ZFS get other call. Uh, it's in the memo file attributes, but I don't know whether it's getting to user space or it's limited somewhere. I, I have feeling there was some security constraint to not give it to user space, but I don't remember, oh. don't remember why. But I think we have local patch to actually allow it to root user on because our systems. That would be quite useful for software like um, Restic, where, which wants a reliable, fast way to find out if a um, file could have changed, a file's right, content yeah. could have changed, even in the face of trickery with M time, A time, and so on. Oh, yeah, that's that's what it was thought also. I don't rem remember why. It, I, I have a feeling it was blocked somewhere, but maybe some deeper investigation could be done, or maybe it could be wired to Linux too. But so far, it seems like it's only on FreeBSD. I have I don't see where, where it's used on Linux. So anybody who is curious can dive and investigate. Good find. Interesting. So. Okay, well. Shall we call it good? And... I can't find any references to Z underscore sec in my FreeBSD 14 tree. Yeah, Mav, do you have a, a, git, a CGIT link or something? Yeah, do you have a link to the header for the struct or something? Or... No, it's ZFS Zenode H uh, line uh, 195 on FreeBSD main. So. In Zenode T, there is Zenode. Is there a file or something? Any source ZFS, file? ZFS underscore Zenode H. H. Yep. Okay. Why didn't I find that? Uh, is that only that's been there for some time? There I is no Z sec in the way. Uh... Is that a. Is that true now specific? I don't know. No, no, I'm looking on FreeBSD okay, sources, cool. yeah. clean. So it's uh, syscon trip open, open ZFS includes sys ZFS underscore zenode dot H. And Can there you is paste a path, pathway at least in, so I get that right. Yeah, um, I, if handy, if not, that's okay. 
Uh, and there's Z node underscore T structure and there Z underscore sec called modification sequence number. Okay, so it's uh, with a Q, not a C. It was ah. Q, a Q. Got it, sorry. If that no. explains why sorry. I didn't find any on the... Yes, it's the modification sequence number. Okay, not, not related to seconds. So then I can change chase. Okay. So in it's probably somewhere here. Cool. Thank you for that. To, where you can maybe inspect it. Cool. Okay. Well. Call it good? Yeah. Well, thank you, everyone, and especially Matt and Steve. Uh, hopefully, we will meet you again. Uh, I may have Antoinette host an online meeting while a bunch of us are tied up with your OBSD con, but I'll just leave that to be determined until I can find a brief moment to think about it. But uh, thank you so much. I'll call it at 206 Pacific. I will be around a few minutes and I welcome you all to look at the upcoming developer summit it is a fantastic event. And thank you Delphix for hosting that. That's fine. Okay, great, take care. Hope I got that right, ETC. Thanks everyone. Bye. Bye. Thanks. See you.